Well, welcome back to the penultimate session of CEDA's inaugural Public Interest Technology Forum. I'm Melinda Salento, CEDA's Chief Executive, and if you've been watching all morning, I'm sure you're sick of me by now, um, but this is the last session that you're going to be hearing from me. Um, I think, as you would have gathered throughout our conversations so far, building and maintaining trust uh, in technology is critical, I think, to enabling the benefits of emerging tech to be realised, as well, of course, as uh, managing the potential risks and adverse impacts. Business through the adoption, use and governance of technology, of course, has an important role to play. And I think it's a theme that's been coming out of many of our sessions, um, including the last session with the insights from the Edmund Trust Barometer um, and, and attitudes towards the role of business in tech uh, and trust in tech itself. Um, using AI as a case study for emerging tech, our panellists today are going to help us to try to understand the state of play in terms of how business sees its role in the use and governance of artificial intelligence and data, building community trust in artificial intelligence uh, and data and its use and the collection, storage and use of data, how businesses are setting themselves up to use AI wisely, uh, and how they're communicating uh, with their stakeholders uh, and their customers around that. And I'd be interested also in getting their perspectives on who owns the responsibility for the development and use of AI wisely within companies. Is it the board? Is it the C-suite? Um, is it the tech experts within the companies? How do we wrap our heads around that? Are there examples of leading companies? I'm sure Yoav is going to put his hand up at Salesforce. Um, and how best practice can be shared, accelerated, promulgated, and uh, use the, what we're doing now to sort of lift the game uh, for all of business. These are all things I'm hoping we're going to touch on in a rapid pace session as we charge through the next hour. To help me do that, um, I've got Yoav Schlesinger, who's the Principal Ethical AI Practice at Salesforce, Bill Simpson-Young, who's the CEO of the Gradient Institute, we had hoped to have Kay Firth Butterfield, who's the head of AI for the World Economic Forum. Kay's unfortunately unwell, so we've given her a leave pass uh, to go and see the doctors, literally. Uh, but she sent her apologies and some comments around what the World Economic Forum is up to. So I'll just address those very quickly. Um, I'm going to do that first, and then I'm going to uh, turn to Yoav and then Bill, just to talk a little bit about what they're doing within their organisations uh, and their focus. Uh, and then it's over to q and I'm hoping the audience is going to have a load of questions and I'll keep an eye on those and make sure we get to as many of them as possible. Uh, and we've got a poll question uh, in the pigeonhole as well, if you'd like to put your two cents worth in there. So with that, let me just kick off on behalf of Kay. Um, the World Economic Forum Global AI Council is really a community of government, business and civil society, technical leaders, committed to shaping the governance and application of artificial intelligence uh, in the global public interest. Um, among other things, the council is looking to how it can co-design policy frameworks and protocols, collaborate on pilot projects and scale up insights and lessons learned from those pilots. AI, AI procurement in a box um, for procurement professionals is something that they've produced. They've got an AI board toolkit, um, a model AI governance um, publication uh, impl implementation and self-assessment guides, as well as cases and case studies to explore. Um, we'll look to circulate as much of that as we can to uh, participants in the forum. But of course, um, if you go and have a look at the website, you'll be able to track down a fair bit of that. I know Bill and Yoav can probably speak to some of what the World Economic Forum is up to as well. So if you've got a question, toss it in and we'll see if someone will give you an answer. Uh, but with that, um, let me hand over to Yoav to tell us a bit about uh, what he's up to at Salesforce. Thanks, Yoav. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I am sitting here in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, um, representing Salesforce, which you may or may not be familiar with. So let me take a quick moment to describe Salesforce and what we do um, so that hopefully I can then contextualize some of our work in ethical and trusted AI. Uh, so Salesforce is the world's number one customer relationship management CRM platform. Uh, so we are a SaaS company and specialize in services that allow businesses to use cloud technology to connect with their customers, partners, and potential customers. So we're in the B2B space, which locates us squarely as a data processor, not a data controller. 
uh, as a result of that, we have a set of unique challenges, I think, in thinking about how to deploy and operationalize ethical AI, um, which I'll touch on briefly here and then um, happy to discuss more during the Q&A, et cetera. Um, but in general, I want to think through how we do exactly what you've described, Madeline, which is uh, transferring principles to operationalization. Um, and how do we take a very values-driven approach to actually putting principles into action um, in our company in terms of product development and deployment? So our number one value, um, Surprise, surprise is trust um, at Salesforce. Um, it, in addition to customer success, innovation, and equality, we feel like trust with our customers and theirs that they build with their customers as a result is the most important thing that we can develop. Um, and in fact, you know, 79% of the workforce cons would consider leaving an employer that demonstrates poor ethics. So we really feel like not only is trust an important value, but it's also a driver of good business. Um, and stemming then from that value of trust, we have sort of a set of trusted AI principles, um, like most either companies or NGOs or uh, go governments at this point, we have articulated a set of principles that we think should be upheld by AI. Um, and those are responsibility, accountability, transparency, empowerment, and inclusion. And those are great words, um, but words are you know, only worth as much as the paper they're written on. So how do we really um, bring those into effect in our global company of 54,000 employees? So I'll talk and touch briefly on sort of three pillars through which we do that work. Um, and those three pillars are employee engagement, product development, and customer empowerment. Um, so in the first, employee engagement, um, you know, we have lots of employees who really want to build ethics into our products um, who, and we need to work to empower those employees to do that work, right? So for example, one common insight we had was that customers need to understand why our AI is making recommendations or predictions in order for it to be trusted. Um, but different user types have different levels of expertise, right? Ranging from data scientists um, who really want to see all the factors used in a model, how strong those factors are, et cetera, versus general users who um, may just want to understand the direction behind a prediction um, and don't want to be confused by all the factors that might confuse a data scientist. Um, in order to do that and to serve those needs, we needed to engage employees in putting ethics at the center to understand the workflows for those people and to build a product that would be responsive to them. So now, for example, we um, include a new hire boot camp that trains all of our is to cultivate an ethics by design mindset. So everyone who comes into our organization has that basic introduction. And so having that sense of ethics embedded culturally enables our success and it really develops what I like to call moral muscle memory, right? Enabling risk spotters in our employee um, base to engage in tough conversations and shifts the responsibility. This is your other question about whose responsibility is it. Um, it really shifts the responsibility for ethics from one central hub to all of the teams responsible for building our products. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is around product development specific and here we're talking about process. Um, we want our teams to ask themselves questions like, how do our products live in the world? Um, how do they impact customers and society? How do we make it easy as possible for our customers to do the right thing and make it hard or even impossible for them to do the wrong thing? Uh, so, you know, sometimes that's as easy as articulating accountability questions at the beginning of the product cycle. Um, we've also introduced a process we call consequence scanning that asks part participants to envision um, potentially unintended negative outcomes of a new feature or proposed product in, um, and then think through how to mitigate those potential harms. Um, or we've instantiated also, for example, a data science review board um, that encourages best practices in data quality and building. So 
the DSRB helps gauge whether teams are effectively remediating bias in their training data. Um, and that board then creates transparency for the organization in how data are collected and used by our machine learning algorithms. Um, so there's a whole lot more I could describe around process there in the second pillar, um, but then quickly to pivot to our third and last pillar, which is about empowerment of our customers. Um, you know, we really believe that the end user of our product needs to have all the tools uh, at their disposal to use AI responsibly. So we're building features proactively into our product that enable them to do that. I'll give one quick example. In um, a product we have called Einstein Discovery, which is kind of a general purpose AI builder, we have a feature called sensitive fields that allows an admin to indicate if a field is sensitive, meaning there might be regulatory restrictions on its use, or it might potentially add bias to a model, like age, race, gender, something of that sort. So that admin can flag a sensitive variable. And then what Einstein Discovery will do is find proxies for that variable that may have been unknown to the admin. So in the United States, for example, we know that because of a history of um, systemic racism, zip code, where a person lives is highly correlated to that person's race. Um, and so if you've chosen to exclude race, uh, Einstein Discovery will source for you the fact that zip code is correlated to race, and you may or may not want to also include zip code in your model. And so it's giving those tools and empowerment to our customers to make um, thoughtful decisions by introducing positive friction into their use of our products so that they can also responsibly put our products into use. Um, so those are just a few quick examples um, of how we're thinking about operationalizing our AI ethics. I have a lot more I could say, but I'll stop there and, and leave it for discussion um, to come. Thank you. I'm sure there's there's a lot more to say. Um, that was already fascinating. Bill, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Gradient Institute and and uh, your focus in this area? Hi, um, Melinda. Thanks. And there's a lot of um, a lot, we're doing a lot of things similar to what to what Yav's doing. So there's, there's some nice commonality there. So and I'm sure that will come out in the discussion. Uh, yeah. So I'm Bill Simpson Young uh, from Gradient Institute. If you're not aware of Gradient Institute, we are an independent, not-for-profit, uh, and a registered charity. We um, were first announced in uh, two, December 2018 by IAG, Australia's largest uh, general insurer, uh, University of Sydney and, and SIRO's Data61. And then we started operating from July last year. So we've been operating for about more than half, about half of our, the time of our operation has been under COVID conditions. So it's uh, been a fun time. The um, So we are... Uh, we're all we're a technical organisation. We're machine learning researchers and practitioners um, working in doing technical research, computer science, you know, machine learning research, um, and designing and developing new techniques and technology to help AI systems operate um, ethically, um, but also providing training to help build capability in businesses and government in how to make sure they have accountability and transparency in their machine learning systems. So um, we're sort of it is a very act, ethical AI is a very active research area at the moment. Uh, we we are actively publishing in the field, but we're also applying what we discover and learn uh, into uh, trying to build up capability within Australia and, and globally um, in the area. The um, just coming back to sort of the main topic of this 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 two days um, session of, of about trust in technology and following on from what Yoav was saying. Um, yeah, Hilary Sutcliffe in her keynote yesterday was talking about. Um, you know, the trust is not built, trust is bestowed. And I love that concept. Um, but the, the, to maximise the likelihood of trust being bestowed on you by your, your customers and the community, you know, there were seven aspects that she talked about, you know, having the, the intent for public interest, the competence, openness, fairness, et cetera. And they're similar to the types of attributes that, uh, that you was talking about. They're also very similar to the types of principles that are in the AI ethics framework that the federal government has put out. Uh, very similar to the OECD guideline and so on. So there's lots of these sets of principles out there in the world now in government and governments and companies um, to help people um, express the ethical intent of their systems. But as Yoff was saying, the key difficulty is actually how do you operationalize that good ethical intent? And it is it is not easy, and it's great to see uh, Yoff and team making some progress there, but it's, it's a big area. There's lots of research going on, lots of, lots of uh, new ideas in this area. Um, some of the, the, one of the things that really scares me actually is when I see businesses who are dealing with the ethical intent and making sure they've, they've got sort of high level governance in place, 
but where they don't necessarily have the technical competence or the or the culture to actually properly operationalize that. Or another you know, thing I'm scared of is where they try to sort of think that they can go and buy in some software that takes away the problem, you know, like outsourcing ethics. You, you can't outsource ethics, right? The real challenge is how you bridge that gap from ethical intent to ethical outcomes of your AI systems. And it's, it's not something that companies can, can outsource. It's not something that companies can, can deal with by checklists at the board or, or executive level. So what, a lot of what we're focused on is how do you provide that mapping, similar to what you was talking about. The, um, I'll just give you a concrete example of one of the sort of situations that happened that led to us forming the Institute and, and making it a not-for-profit and, a, and, a, and a, with a focus on capability building. We had one of our data scientists uh, before we started um, was working on uh, a really important system within government. Right? And what he noticed was that you know, he's writing code you know, and he, he noticed that he had to impute missing data. So, so data is always messy, right? Data is not this beautiful, clean thing that you're given. It's always messy. There's always lots of missing data. And there's lots of ways in, in machine learning and, and in statistics generally of how you, what value you put in when some data is missing. You know, it's called imputation of missing data. How, and there's lots of different algorithms you can use for that. And a lot of people might use those different algorithms in, interchangeably. But this, this, this data scientist realized that the algorithm he chose from the set available uh, would actually have an impact on thousands of people um, and their lives. And it was a fairly arbitrary decision from a technical point of view. And he realized there was no real governance structure that was guiding him on how he should make that choice. And we realized that there was a gap between, you know, the level at which a system's being governed and the level at which that system's being implemented. And coming back to your question, Melinda, about responsibility. Yeah, you know, he felt responsibility as a technical person to make the right decision, but he felt there was no guidance on how to make that right decision. And so this is sort of a lot of what we're doing is trying to make sure that the technical issues are exposed at a governance level. So the trade-offs can be made at a policy or, or, or governance level for the actual technical considerations that are there. And at the moment, they often don't get made. Those trade-offs don't necessarily get made at the right level within organizations. So you, you do have the situation now, coming back to responsibility, you do have the situation now where software engineers and data scientists are making decisions that they don't necessarily realize have massive implications for people's lives, uh, but without the good governance to help them make those decisions. So, so this is the sort of thing we're trying to, to work on. A um, couple of examples of what we're doing now, uh, we're just finishing up some work now, um, writing a methodology for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So this is at a consortium of 25 banks and insurance companies, um, global banks and insurance companies but, but working in Singapore. That's a methodology for responsible AI that is this operationalization method. So we're specifically looking at uh, fairness in uh, credit scoring, risk scoring more generally, but also customer marketing. Um, and what this methodology is, I can't say too much because it's actually being launched next week at the Singapore FinTech Festival, but it basically um, provides a fairly detailed technical methodology for a bank or insurance company that would it be able to be audited such that the system would be able to be audited by an internal or external auditor. Um, it, it's got a lot of, you know, there's some questions you need to answer, but then from the questions that are answered, there is actually a an auditable methodology that can be somebody can test on the system. So it's quite, it, it is quite, quite, a, we're quite proud of the work. I think hopefully it'll have some, some, some impact. Um, I hope it'll have a lot of impact on the Singapore finance industry and hopefully uh, released elsewhere. Unfortunately, I can't say more about it, but if anyone's interested, uh, let me know and uh, I'll send you a copy as soon as it's released, which is next, hopefully next week. The, um, a lot of, the work we've been doing also, uh, Ed, Ed Santo, the Human Rights Commissioner, talked about it uh, yesterday. We've just released a major report with them last week that um, is looking at different sources of algorithmic bias in AI systems. And the, um, what, what we show there is we actually have a detailed simulation, which is using a fairly sort of common example, um, which, which happens to be a retail, electricity, retail energy example, but actually can be applied to, any, to, to a large number of different types of scenarios. But we look at the different types of algorithmic bias that come in from um, you know, where there's societal bias, where you've got a gap between you know, the, the sort of concept of equality in society and the actual society now, you know, that's a gap. Then there's a gap between society and the data. You know, there's no such thing as raw data. Uh, data. Data might be inaccurate, insufficient, or, or unrepresentative, or, or out of date. There's lots of things that can be wrong with data, you know, but that creates a gap. 
um, that can lead to, to, to discrimination. And then there's a gap between the data and the model. So, you know, a model is always an approximation, You're using a model for predictions or decisions. But again, that gap can lead to to people in vulnerable circumstances being poorly treated and so on. So what, what this, this report does is it actually works through a detailed example, looks at a whole lot of specific types of algorithmic bias. And for each of those with the worked example shows what would actually happen in practice. And then it comes, it has these key recommendations. And you know, what you know, Ed referred to this briefly yesterday, but one of the key points from this report is that human rights need to be considered whenever a company is using a new technology um, like AI to make important decisions. And that is quite, easy if for companies who are not being careful about what they're doing to actually have um, to have systems that are not lawful you know, from a discrimination point of view. And so it is there's an onus on all companies using technology to be thinking about these things well before the AI system is, is developed to ensure they're actually acting fair and lawfully. Uh, so it's not just about ethics, it's also about being lawful. Um, and so that report sort of goes into quite a bit of detail. It's written, it, it has, it, we had the challenge of a bunch of human rights lawyers and a bunch of techies, data scientists, you know, writing this report together. And we actually, um, we did come up with a, uh, something that made sense to all of us, which we were very <laughs> happy about, because that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so the, um, I won't say more about that. But one of the key areas we're working on actually is building up the capability. You know, as I said, you know, we, a lot of data scientists don't know how to build an AI system ethically. They get taught how to build an AI system, but they don't really learn how to do it ethically. We've been teaching data scientists and software engineers for a few years now, but we get comments like, when, when we, we run our courses, we get comments like, wow, I've been building machine learning systems for years and I didn't realize how much damage I was causing. Or, um, I mean, or, or I now realize that my job is just not to build some tech to spec using tech capability, but to actually, the part of my role is to expose the difficult decisions and trade-offs to people who are responsible for the system uh, so that they can make decisions. And, and that, that insight that they gain from that is, is really heartening uh, to, to see that. We're also doing um, AI leadership training. We've just recently um, teamed up with Katrina Wallace and her team at Ethical AI Advisory to work on executive training for both board board and exec teams, which has that combination of the technical understanding from our organization and the governance understanding from hers. So um, we're just starting on that now, which is, is quite exciting now. So um, a lot more I can say, but we'll say that in the, um, in the discussion, no doubt. Thanks, Bill. Um, there, there's a lot in that as well. Uh, um, can I just make a couple of, call out a couple of things that I thought were really um, insightful or helpful for the conversation we've been having over the past couple of days? And, one is that um, while we're using AI or machine learning as, an, as a bit of a case study here to sort of unpack some of this stuff, not least because of the ubiquity of it and of the principles that AI principles, frameworks, et cetera, et cetera, um, you made the really strong point about all, you know, we need to be thinking about these issues when we adopt all emerging um, technologies and, and thinking about what their potential impact is for good and for bad um, and really not just doing that in a passive way, but but really exploring it. Um, it reminded me of the comment that um, Joe Sofra uh, made, and I, I, I told him I was going to use this again, and I'm going to use it straight out of the gate, but when he, when he talked about um, being risk dumb um, and sort of essentially taking risks that you didn't really fully understand or, or, or weren't even aware of, which I think is your point too, Bill, around um, it's actually easy to be not lawful um, in some of these circumstances. So really interesting point. I'm going to pause for a second and say to the audience that you've got here two people who are really expert in this topic. It's something that is really on everyone's mind. A lot of people are using um, machine learning. Um, it's the sort of tech everywhere. Got to be on the bandwagon. If you've got any questions, I'm I'm not. You know, I don't care how granular they are. Here's your moment to figure out how you can um, learn from these these two gentlemen here on our screens. Um, now. I am gonna I'm gonna go straight to the poll question because this is the elephant in the room, I think. When Ed and Matt were talking about ethics um, and human rights on our you know first day of this forum, you know, they both remarked that there are a lot of AI frameworks, a lot of AI principles, um, and actually a lot of them don't have not made a jot of difference at all. Uh, and because it does come right down to this issue of implementation. Now the poll question that we asked the audience was this. 
do you think businesses are trying and succeeding in doing the right thing when it comes to using AI wisely, responsibly, and ethically? And the response, <laughs> there's 11% that say yes. <laughs> Right, so so here's the elephant in the room. My first question to you was going to be: There's a fair degree of cynicism and lack of trust in business and business motives. So, if only 11% of our audience, who who I would think are a relatively informed audience, think that that um, businesses are doing a good job here, what what's what's going on? What what is the priority? How can we actually change that that um, perception and and or change well and change what business is up to? Um, you know, I've this has got to be your bread and butter every day. So can I start with you on that? Sure. Um, and thank you to the 11% of you um, who said yes to that question. Um, look, I think that there is no question that business is challenged around these sets of issues. Um, it would be foolhardy to think that anyone has this figured out. Um, and there's a natural suspicion of the, you know, uh, capitalist, right, uh, drive behind many of these companies and the suspicion of that profit motive as underlying the decisions that are being made around these sets of issues about responsible deployment of technology, adoption of technology, et cetera. Um, I, and I can't speak for the business community at large, though I would like to. Um, I can speak for us when I say that our focus on stakeholder capitalism instead of shareholder capitalism is the pivot that is absolutely required in order to breathe authenticity into the oper operationalization of principle, right? Um, if a business is driven solely by shareholder capitalism, I think the scrutiny and the suspicion is probably well-placed to a degree. Um, if a company is living stakeholder capitalism authentically, which means bringing to the table all the people who may be impacted by your technology, positively or negatively, and involving them deeply in the process of understanding the impact of those technologies, then I think there is a lot uh, longer runway and a, and a longer leash for um, experimentation for innovation for learning, um, which is frankly, you know, in, in the um, walk, uh, excuse me, crawl, walk, run um, stage of development, we are definitely in crawl. You know, it, it, we are not even walking as an industry in thinking about how to do this well. We are in the infant nascent stages of ethical AI. Um, you know, we're probably like the security industry was in the mid 1980s um, in the sense that, you know, we're just shipping product without debugging, without uh, adversarial testing, without red teaming. There were no standard processes for doing that work back in the 80s, but look how far we've come 35, 30, 35 years later. And I think that as an industry of ethical AI, we're probably in the same phase. Um, so cutting some maturation and development of an industry along with an authentic stakeholder capitalism will hopefully push business to doing better by doing good. Um, I've got a question straight off the, off the bat there, but I'm going to go to Bill. What, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I, I agree with you up there and, and particularly on the how early we are in the ethical AI journey. Um, it's a pity in the way that you know, AI use is, is really going very fast, but an ethical AI is also going fast, but it's, it's, um, it's really important that organizations using AI take AI seriously, Re realize that the harms they can be causing and make sure that they are doing something about that. Because I mean, although, although it's still a young industry, I do think that there's enough out there now that companies can do what they do well with the appropriate governance and the appropriate technical expertise. Um, as I said before, I think one of the biggest problems is, is just there are a lot of companies who don't yet, I mean, we, we, when I talked about our training. Yeah, we have people come to our training who've, who've just recently completed a machine learning course who haven't been introduced to even concepts like testing your model, <laughs> you know, proper validation, proper model validation. You know, why can, 
how can validator models fail in production, all these sort of issues that, that we teach. And, and they've just done machine learning course and they don't know this stuff. And I think there needs to be a real change in the way machine learning education is done so that more of these concepts get woven into the core machine learning. Because um, the right place to get these skills, the technical skills in there is at the student level, right? We shouldn't be waiting till people are out there building production code before they start thinking about ethics. Um, the, so, but then you've got this issue in companies. There's a lot of companies who think when they're putting an AI system in there, they think that they're procuring an external system that's going to do their AI, their AI for them, and they don't realise that they still need to understand in detail the types of harms that can happen and the way in which those harms can be managed and avoided and mitigated. Um, it is really important that companies have... Now, I know you hear this a lot, but I'm a great believer in this, that all organisations, if they're going to be using technical products like AI, they need to have technical competence at a senior level right up to board level, right? If you, if you don't have the technical competence at the board level, you, you're gonna, it's going to be much harder to make mistakes. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. There's a question I can I can flip straight to you, Bill, um, that has come from um, Andrew Tuvey, who said, I work in smart cities with a humanities background, and I'm always frustrated by the poor ethical and cultural literacy among STEM researchers. You know, how can universities embed this stuff more broadly in the STEM courses? And, and I mean, do we see... Is there a differentiation? Are, are people who are looking for um, these capabilities in the market, are, you, are either of you actually seeing differentiation where universities or courses that are well known or well regarded for embedding these ethical conditions, uh, considerations are actually kind of coming to the top of the list? Um, Bill, first you, and then I'll, yeah, I'll just get your insights on that as well. So, so I don't think, I agree that there is a problem with STEM education not dealing with this sort of issue. I don't think it's a problem with the individuals who do STEM education, I think it's actually just, it hasn't woven its way into STEM. I mean, we've just recently advertised for, you know, for summer scholars to work with us over the, over the, um, over the summer holiday. Um, just so students, you know, second year students, uh, second or third year students coming to work for us for, for, for 10 weeks. We were blown away by the level of interest in the work that we do by computer science students. Um, really, you know, the quality of the students were fantastic. And, and it just made, I think there are a lot of people out there who do, care about the ethics what they do they just don't have access to ways of learning um i still think that the the techniques and, and you know the research community is still working on a lot of these techniques so it's all very new but it's really important that i think it's easy to fix just with the right skills being taught to the right people either preferably at university if not at university um you know, early on within their company life um they're getting exposed to these ideas they get to see what sort of harms happen they get to they get exposure to the types of techniques that can actually address and mitigate these these harms. Um, sorry, that's all. No, so yeah, I mean, I'm interested. Is it something that you, when you're employing people, do you, do you sort of screen for that as a prerequisite, or is it something that Salesforce is just saying we've got to put our stamp on this and it's just part of the training piece? You know, I know when I started my career years and years ago at Federal Treasury, they just sort of, you know, there's a whole block of stuff that they just taught you that maybe you should have learned at university, but you kind of got another dose again. What's the philosophy at Salesforce? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we are really careful in thinking about how our, our hiring process for diversity and inclusion and all that sort of thing. And, and certainly programs that are promoting this kind of integrated approach to technical and socio-technical education tend to produce graduates who have really interesting backgrounds, really interesting points of view on impacts, all sorts of things. And so those people tend to do very well um, in thinking through these challenges. Um, interdisciplinary programs like information schools, like human computer interaction programs, et cetera. Um, I think we're seeing more and more, at least in the United States, integration of that um, either sociological or political or uh, humanities orientation into technical curriculum. And I think that's the next horizon for STEM education is figuring out how to embed ethical consideration as part of the work of learning, uh, building code, making code. It's, it can't be an ancillary activity, even within a program where over here you're doing technical work and over here you're learning techniques for remediating bias. 
th those two things need to be uh, put together so that every coding exercise has a human element to it rather than building code and making code around optimizing sales uh, for the weather, you know, sales of popsicles for the weather, let's optimize getting, you know, uh, cooling refreshments to people who are in need of it, which could look like a variety of different kinds of people, right? So take that same exercise and optimize for human value and benefit instead of profit um, and, and create that exercise that way from the outset. Um, and I think that the people who are learning those skills are becoming more and more attractive to companies because of this recognition that this is an integrated requirement They're, that saying I'm an engineer and therefore not responsible for that thing is no longer an acceptable response. So I've got a, a question, which I think is, it, it's an interesting one because I think it's going to, um, I think there's an answer to the question, but I think Bill might expand on it, but and I'll, I'll let you deal with it first and then I'll come back. <laughs> um, so the question I've got is, you know, when government agencies are procuring um, techno uh, a technology, how can they ensure that they select businesses that genuinely design with ethics as a priority? And how can that be built into uh, procurement processes? So people are helping them design technology in particular. Um, for our previous session, we had a lot, we had a big conversation. Well, we reflected on the fact that the government's own use of machine learning perhaps has, has not done a lot to um, build confidence. But so any views on, on that? Yeah, I think it's really important that, again, I mean, if, sorry if I end up repeating myself a bit here, but, you know, it's important that if, government are procuring from a company that they're not just being fooled by expressions of ethical orientation. <laughs> they're being convinced by evidence of ethical operation, right? So, you know, because there's a massive difference between the two. There's a, a lot of people sort of talk about AI for good and, and this sort of stuff, which is, you know, taking existing AI systems and using them for, for good purposes. And there are companies who, who specialize in this sort of area and that's, that's great, that's wonderful and important and necessary um it, but it's different from ensuring that a company has the technical expertise to be actually avoiding the type of algorithmic biases that are leading to to un unfair or un illegal discrimination um it's a very different type of technical capability um the it's also the case as i said before that that you know you can't outsource ethics so it's really important that the government agency has the technical capability themselves. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, this is a bit of a different area, but I remember, um, you know, probably 2017 odd, um, after the census incident, when the, the special advisor to the prime minister did a review and one, one, of, the, one of the complaints that were one of the, the observations from the special advisor to the PM on cybersecurity made was that the government was over relying on the vendor for the technical expertise needed such that they weren't producing the adequate level of supervision of the work that would have potentially avoided, you know, the issues that happened. Um, and so this is, this is a really important point in procurement. You know, procurement isn't about outsourcing responsibility. It's about bringing in, in technical expertise and, and product. Um, but it's really important that the organisations doing the, the procurement actually have enough capability themselves, technical and governance, um, to make sure that they can actually oversee a, the and, and closely supervise and monitor and audit uh, the systems that's being be, being deployed and and as as I think in an early conversation you were saying Melinda it is the, and Ed mentioned yesterday it's you know with with AI it's not set and forget yeah you, know, you can't just put an AI system there and just leave it because it a lot of AI systems will change their behaviour over time depending on the data so you have to be monitoring over time. So that's another thing this is important for procurement as well. When you're budgeting for a procurement to bring in a system, you need to be for the future as well because you're budgeting for the ongoing monitoring. Um, you can't just, you know, you get concepts like concept drift or, or you know, covariate shift. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong in a system that's in operation in the real world that's been trained on, on data in, from the old world. <laughs> yeah, so there's all sorts of things that can go on. So lots of... Uh, governance and technical issues there. I don't know if I've answered your question, but. No, no, no. And you went to where I was expecting you to uh -huh. in terms of, um, you know, you can't, yes, it's, look, I think it's important to to deal with people who you believe start from the perspective of ethic, 
behaving ethically, um, particularly in government, uh, but that at the end of the day, you know, you've got to continue to own the responsibility for that. You, it's not just a, a plug in, uh, you know, a plug and play and, and move on sort of, um, you've, got, you've got to take responsibility and accountability for the fact that these things can, you know, continue to um, to learn and, and can, as you said, you know, end up in a different place to where you thought you were setting them up in the first instance. Um, Yo, have anything that you wanted to add to Bill's comments on that? No, I think that's right. Um, I would echo everything Bill said. And as the company that is the provider to many of these procurers, um, I would say that, you know, we're more than happy to have our tires kicked. Um, that's the appropriate role for governments um, and procurers in the public sector to, to take with their vendors. Um, and that scrutiny is appropriate and necessary to ensure that society is bettered and that uh, you know, AI systems don't go rogue in the wild. So plus one to everything Bill said. Yeah. So yeah, let me, uh, let me ask a follow-up question and um, <laughs> your reference to, um, to AI possibly being like, um, you know, financial products in the 1980s it was a moment of pause for me <laughs> because I kind of thought, whoops, maybe, I mean, is, is transparency enough, right? Um, or in that sort of um, ethical principles and, you know, there's a question from from one of the audience around um, is how much of the effort really needs to be driven by regulation um, versus their, your own initiative within a business. And, and, and I think there's a question here about, again, it goes to this issue around confidence and trust and, and how we actually earn that. Because if the regulation can't be effective, then the community will gain, may, may feel, have certain expectations around that. But if it doesn't deliver against them, that doesn't work either. So I'm, I am interested in your genuine sort of sense of what, what works and for where the industry is at the moment. Yeah. Um, so first, don't think that regulation delivers trust. Um, regulation delivers compliance, right? And so that is setting a floor, not a ceiling for ethics. Um, so when we're talking about regulation versus whatever you want to call it, you know, governance or self-regulation or however you want to describe the thing that a company does to uphold these principles, I think neither one is sufficient in and of itself and both are necessary. So, um, because they serve different functions, uh, self-regulation or right? Ethics, whatever you want to call that thing, builds trust. It engenders trust. It builds ethics. It um, ensures accountability and transparency, those kinds of things. While regulation, which is a top-down approach to that, to meet that bottoms up, um, it ensures that compliance and that there is a minimum threshold met for um, a customer or a consumer or an agency's sense that the legal thresholds and accountabilities are being met. Um, so no, is transparency enough in and of itself? Absolutely not. Is accountability in and of itself? Absolutely not. Are all of them going to be needed in order for us to succeed? 100%. There's no question in my mind that it's, it's a yes and proposition. This is not uh, either or question. So do we need, do we need something more in a regulatory stick or is it a case of just applying existing laws to the outcomes of um, machine learning or I'm putting um, you on the spot now. <laughs> no, okay. Look, I think it's both, you know, Bill earlier said, right. How the importance of culture. And I think we've seen even in the banking industry, for example, um, you know the the limits of regulation to enforce ethical behaviors in broken corporate cultures, right? That where the culture doesn't support that regulation, we still see behavior that doesn't align with what we would hope for as society in terms of ethical outcomes, right? And so the stick of regulation gets you some way to the goalposts um, and ethical culture is required to get you the rest of the way. You, you cannot imagine that the stick of regulation is going to do all of the work um, that needs to be done. So a couple of questions. Uh, oh, sorry, Bill, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, just a couple of things. So um, as, as Ed said yesterday, um, you know, people, Ed Santo said yesterday, you know, it is the case that there's already legislation that does apply to AI systems, um, applies to all systems, you know, all decision-making, uh, human decision-making, AI decision-making, 
And it is also the case that a lot of companies aren't really taking that seriously enough. So, for example, discrimination, the example here. Um, and that some AI systems are acting in a way that could potentially be seen as being discriminatory. So, so if and I do, I do believe there probably are areas where there needs to be regulations, but it shouldn't be sort of the AI law. Um, it should be you know, where there is existing laws that need need um, modification, then those are modified accordingly. Um, one area that that you know we've been talking to people about recently, you know, is in the in the um, administration uh, law where administrative law where there are you know the way in which the law deals with automated decision making may need to be different from how it deals with human decision making because there are some subtleties in the way that um, decision making is done. So take a, a classic example in with direct and indirect discrimination often with human decision making if it's shown that a person uses a particular attribute to make a decision you know, that might be direct discrimination. With an AI system, with a machine learning system, I've, I've seen organisations who are trying to avoid um, direct discrimination, so they withhold some data. And this is coming back to something Yoff was saying earlier. Yeah, if you withhold a piece of data, say gendered data, from an AI system, it might make it uh, more fair, but it's actually more likely to make just hide the discrimination so that there's some other attributes that correlate with gender that are being used by the machine learning system to make the decision, but now you can't see that, that, that anymore. And so you can actually be moving what would have otherwise been direct discrimination to be indirect discrimination. Now, there's a lot of, and, and which is, it is probably not a good outcome because you end up you know, hiding it more. I think what needs to happen is um, there probably does need to be changes around the law in those sort of areas, and there are people looking into that. Um, so, but, but again, it's sort of more just incremental changes to existing laws uh, rather than the, an AI law. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, really interesting point. And I think just to illuminate, you know, to Yav's comment about postcodes, if you if you took race out and threw a zip code in in the US, you may actually get a, a similar outcome. But for someone looking at it, they wouldn't necessarily understand that to be the case. Uh, so, gee, a lot of complexity. So a couple of more questions I'm going to throw at you. Um uh, and to, to those of you who are voting and whatever else, I'm going to get to the, the most uh, important ones, but I'm sort of picking and choosing uh, according to where the conversation's running. Um, is ethical AI necessarily going to perform worse, uh, well, wor worse than unconstrained AI? And you can think about what you mean by worse or not. Uh, so I guess it's by, by putting the filters on, do you, do you put your hand on your heart and say it performs better or worse? I can tell you that first. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So this, I'll, I'll say two different aspects of that. One is uh, if people read the read the recent report um, from the Ethics Centre and Deloitte on um, on you know that, that ethics actually is is good for business. Uh, so that, that's that's one whole angle which I won't, I won't go into more. But go and read that report if you haven't read it already. The um, what we've found is. You know, we, we often do visualizations where you're looking at trade-offs. So, you know, and often, you know, you, if you want the most accuracy, um, it may be if you want both accuracy and fairness. Um, and, and you know, fairness is a really complex concept, and which we won't go into now to the scope here. But yeah, you know, there's lots of different ways of measuring fairness, and there's no all of those ways of measuring fairness are actually incompatible with with, with, with each other. This is algorithmic fairness in a computer science point of view. Um, so you can't actually have optimal fairness. So. You, it's a it's a govern it's a decision by the people governing a system or making setting policies to work out what type of fairness they want to have and how they want to, to what extent they want to trade that off against accuracy. You know, so I'm talking about the accuracy of a prediction of a model. Now, what we've found is that typically the amount of accuracy you lose is in the noise. Um, it, you know, it depends. Very, this is context dependent, very dependent on the application. But it's not the case that you're you're not trading off accuracy and fairness you're actually navigating a complex space such that accuracy and fairness are in that space. But typically the amount of change that the amount of accuracy you're, you're, you're actually taking away in order to be fair uh, could be negligible. So it's not, it, you, you should never be choosing between precision and, 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 and ethics, right? <laughs> ethics is a given. And then you get as accurate as you can given that. Ethics. And you know, we, we do a lot of work on the, on visualization of, space so that people can make decisions that are good for business and good for, and good ethically, which are, which should be aligned, as I said. Yeah. You have anything to add? That, well, that's borne out by experience, 100%. Uh, it is not, and uh, again, it's not an either or. We, you, can, you can achieve definitional fairness 
demographic parity, whatever, whatever um, definition of fairness you want to operationalize. I think there are 21 definitions of fairness currently in circulation. Um, so if you want, you you can absolutely achieve the performance and accuracy precision of a model while not while achieving those benchmarks and thresholds for fairness. There's no question. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, I think there's a, let me see if I can paraphrase this question. Um, so the, the question is using AI and ML sounds efficient. What is the actual capability for this to be used in a way that benefits citizens and consumers? And I guess this is a, you know, throughout the, the sort of two mornings, we've heard a little bit about tech being hyped um, and people kind of then almost overreacting to, you know, oh, if it, it can do all these amazing things and cause great benefit, but also great harm. So how powerful is this tool? Uh, well, how powerful is AI? I guess that depends on how you want to think about it. Um, and I am not an Elon musk future of all, um, you know, humanity is at risk because of general AI. Um, but AI has the potential to automate billions of decisions and judgments and predictions on a scale previously unimagined by human beings. So I don't know what the latest social science research is on the number of decisions I as a human being make in the course of a day. Uh, take that, you know, to some astronomical exponential um range and now you've got ai at scale right and so what it you know i there are obviously harms but the ability to make those kinds of judgments and predictions on um anything and everything frankly um is you know it, it is a tool and so how how um powerful is a tool it depends on what you use the tool for um you know ai is not uh a, it is not yet uh, autonomous. It doesn't operate in a vacuum. It is operated by human beings who put it to a task. Um, and what we are able to do with AI is just scale and automate that task in some incredibly complicated ways. Um, but it is just performing a task that may be for human beings Im impossible to do. And so that is the power, um, I, I think, in the promise of AI. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can speak to this too. Um, having observed the use of it and on, on issues of safety and the ability of, um, you know, being able to, to get access to a whole bunch of safety incidents for years and years and years, and then to be able to search for commonality of factors um, to, to then understand what the, the risks were around future activities, um, which you could never have done previously. When you're sort of looking through the records of an organisation that span back over 50 years and to try to say, well, I'm doing this thing and it has this unique characteristic and this other unique characteristic. And how does that relate to 50 years of experience um, without some form of machine sort of learning, you would never be able to do that. And so, I, I mean, I think it's, and, but to, to my mind, to the extent that you can do that, then you have to be absolutely conscious of the way in which you can combine those insights and information in unexpected ways that have unintended consequences and trying to, to be really, um, really alert to that. Um, I mean, this is a slightly off topic, but it, I think it goes to the issue of, of confidence. Off topic in the sense that we're talking about the role of business in sort of using AI and building trust. But we've got a question from Dr. Michael De Percy who, who asks how both of you can use AI in delivering public services um, and how would that be received by citizens? And you know, what, what are your perspectives on that? And, and perhaps if we broaden it out a little bit and say, you know, what is it that's needed to give uh, the community confidence, and that that is an issue for business as well. I mean, how how do we continue to sort of engage and communicate in a way that builds trust and confidence in the outcomes being delivered by uh, machine learning? Bill, do you want to start off with that? Yeah, I, I think I mean building trust and confidence, as you know, coming repeating that the quote from Hillary Sutcliffe yesterday is you know that trust is not built, trust is is, is bestowed, right? Um, so. Actually, there's a concept in in in, in there's a, there's an area of academic uh, work at the moment on trust in AI that's coming from sort of the the business analytics um, area where they talk about different three different types of trust: um, simple trust, 
which is where you rely on something on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, so for example, we, you know, most of us use a mapping application like Google Maps, and we, we trust that's using AI. We, tr we trust that. Um, and, but that's mostly because we've used it for a long time and it mostly works. You know, we might get the occasional um, dead end or the occasional um, bad traffic decision, but, but it mostly works. So we trust that technology. That's, that's simple trust. You know, you just, you know that it works, you rely on it, you get used to it. And, and but what simple trust means is you're not, you're not needing to exercise control over that decision-making process. You're not needing to monitor it carefully. You trust it to do it itself. Okay. The, the next, next type is what they call reflective trust, where you are actually considering, you, it's a cognitive process where you're thinking about the attributes of this person or AI system. Um, and you know, you know that it's a good brand, say a company, you, you know that it's, um, you know, it's got these sort of practices in place, there's good ethical design processes. And so that, that's what they call reflective trust. And the third one is paradigmatic trust, which is a combination of the two, which is sort of the, the most typical trust when you're, you're trusting a person or, 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 a, or a system where you've got a combination of, of um, knowing how, you know, why it should be trustworthy, but also having the confidence in, in trust. So, for example, flying in a plane, right? When you, you, you go and fly in a plane, you, 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 you expect it's not going to fall out of the sky. That's because of past experience on the one hand, um, just you're used to it, you're not thinking about it too much. And then on the other hand, you actually know that there are, safety systems in place around that, 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 that machine. You know that there's qualifications that people need to be engineers for aircrafts. You know that there's, you know, accident investigations every time there's an accident. So, you know, that, that, that's sort of the typical type of trust. Now, what we need to get to with AI and so coming back to, the, to public service delivery is getting both that, that, that reflective trust, so knowing that the, using appropriate practices in designing that and, and delivering those AI systems, but also the being in the habit of trusting from good experiences in the past. Now, um, there isn't actually a huge amount of AI use in government uh, yet. Um, it's starting to be, um, but but you know it's it is it's definitely starting, and uh, and a lot of there's a lot of keenness as a, as I think is appropriate. Um, but I think for citizens, I, I think what needs to happen is if if government is providing services along the lines of of the sort of AI that people are used to, like, you know, your Google Maps sort of applications, then um, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's frequently, if, it, if it's you know, known to be reliable and then, then people trust it. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thanks, Bill. So we've got um, three or four more minutes. Um, and so perhaps um, I might just ask a, uh, a final question and take that liberty. Um, and maybe you could just sort of help me, but you may and may not be able to sort of put a number around this, but, you know, what's your sense of the proportion of um, sort of medium to large businesses that are actually using AI or machine learning now? And that's the first question. Um, and the second question is, you know, as I'm listening to you, if, if I'm sitting there thinking, yikes, um, I'm on the board of company A or whatever, and I know that we've started doing this, but I'm not sure... Um, whether we, we, you know, our approach was a buy and insert and walk away or, you know, have we got the capabilities? What, what are your recommendations? You know, what are the, the top three things that someone needs to do if they're sitting there going, I'm not sure about this? Um, Yo, yeah, I've how about, so how many businesses are using it, give or take? And if you've started and you don't know what you're doing, what do you do? <laughs> uh yeah, you left you left the easy questions for the end, huh, Melinda? Um, okay, so uh, I have to imagine that of the large businesses that we're talking about, if you want to, you know, the Fortune 500, I'd be shocked if 98 or 99 percent of them weren't using some AI application somewhere. Um, I might be surprised if it weren't 100, but I don't want to quite go that far. Um, right, it, it's a ubiquitous tool at this point um, for large business. So. With that said, um, I think that there's probably woeful unpreparedness for the ethical implications of that across the enterprise. And so what are the first two or three steps that need to be taken? One is to engage leadership early and often in the conversations about what trusted AI and ethical AI is going to be for your company. What are your accountabilities? What are your responsibilities to your stakeholders? And have um, both the board and the C-suite leadership engaged in that conversation early. Second is to build um, 
and, and or start to build that culture of empowerment and engagement with your employees that has this conversation so that it's distributed, so that there is no singular owner or hub for ethics. Um, if there is an ethics person in your company, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, let me rephrase that. Having an ethics person is useful. You're not doing it wrong to have an ethics person, but if it's only that person responsible for ethics, then you're doing it wrong. Um, everyone needs to have ethics as part of their job, just the same way they have security compliance or privacy or whatever else as part of their job and responsibility for work at your company. And then lastly, I would say, um, articulating your values and your principles, <laughs> and then, um, doing the hard work of operationalizing them. That is hard work, but you need to start somewhere and starting with the articulation of the principles will give you the foundation on which to build that process. Thanks, Joe. That was um, actually really on point and not difficult at all, clearly. <laughs> Bill? Yeah. Um, okay, so in, in answer to the question of how much use is out there, I, I agree with what Yov was saying about Fortune 500. I mean, it's, you know, the, obviously the banks, you know, the, the big companies are all using AI, no, no, no question at all. Uh, the big companies that do, do lots of transactions, even, you know, in both banking, energy, um, but, but I mean, it's obviously banking is much more mature than in say, say energy companies, energy companies are starting to use machine learning much more. Um, anyone who deals with customers <laughs> is probably using machine learning. Yeah, at scale is using machine learning. Um, it's actually interesting you ask that because it gives me a chance to talk about something we're, about, we're doing at the moment, which is uh, we're actually doing, a, uh, we're working with um, Ethical AI Advisory and uh, Fifth Quadrant, a uh, market research firm, to develop a, a responsible AI uh, index, uh, which will initially be a responsible AI survey to, and building a responsible AI maturity model. Uh, so this in Australia, it's actually running very shortly. Uh, if anyone wants to know about it, contact me. Um, and where we've designed a methodology where we can actually measure the, the maturity of companies using AI from a responsible AI point of view, um, but with a goal to eventually have, I mean, initially we won't be, um, um, the index won't be per company, it'll be more per, per sector um, because there's still a lot of companies struggling with the maturity aspect of responsible AI. Uh, but over the next few years, hopefully we'll see that become much more mature and, and where, where it does make sense for companies to be, you know, uh, in, a, in a more of an index. The um, three quick things. I shall agree with what you have said. Um, yeah, definitely capability. <laughs> yeah, so, so technical capability, I, I think having a, I, I'm really impressed with companies that do have an ethics committee, um, like people, like companies like IAG has an ethics committee uh, chaired by Simon Longstaff from the Ethics Centre. They do a really good job. They, um, but but that's not to say that they're taking the responsibility away from all the staff for ethics. Um, but it is a central point for ensuring that the capability, you know, ethical capability is built up within the organisation and within the staff. Uh, so it's not it's not you know as I agree with you. It's a problem. You don't want to have, make that one person responsible for ethics, but you do want to have a central point within the organisation to provide to ensure you've got good governance of, of your ethics. Um, I, capability building, technical capability, and leadership, ethical AI leadership, um, and starting small and iterating. Don't go in big with um, you know trying to make you know, using AI throughout your whole business without actually starting small and then building up. Um, that way you can. Because what happens with AI systems often is the vulnerable customers who will get most negatively affected. You know, you, we call it the AI cycle of disadvantage. You've got this, you, you get different, you get worse data for people who are in more vulnerable circumstances and you often get worse predictions, so you actually get worse outcomes. So you can easily get these cycles of vulnerability that just make the vulnerable more vulnerable. So if you are gonna do anything with AI, just just start small and then and iterate up. Um, but that, that'll <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks, Bill. I know I gave you. Uh, I, I know I gave you both an impossible task, but but I did just reflecting on the comments throughout the session. I thought, well, if someone's sitting there now worried about, um, oh gosh, what have I done? And I've let the genie out of the bottle. <laughs> can I can I pull it back in? I thought maybe that would be really helpful. And I think given the reflections we've had throughout the the, the two days about yes, these principles are there, but how do we make them real? I think both of you um, really helped to do that and, and focused on some really critical things for, um, for business and quite frankly, all stakeholders to be reflecting on and the questions that they can ask and the skills and capabilities they need to build. So thank you, um, Bill and Yav, for your fantastic insights. Um, Bill, I know there's a couple of things that you said if people are interested um, in connecting. Um, anyone who's interested in engaging on these issues or the public technology work 
more broadly should feel free to be in touch with me um, and you can email um, at info um, at cedar, sorry, cedar, info at cedar.com.au um, or go onto the website and connect uh, with us there. Um, it's been a fantastic two mornings. We are going to round it out with some insights from our advisory committee, our Public Interest um, Technology Advisory Committee. That's going to kick off um, at one o'clock and be chaired by Karen Cummins from uh, Cummin from IBM. Uh, and then I'll close out um, for the forum itself. But thank you again, Bill and Yoav. Um, a few minutes until we get back online at one for the closing session. Thanks so much. <laughs>